Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. One very memorable incident that occurred to Kim and I while we were in Washington is that we had to take taxis, of course, often running all over the city. And almost all of the taxi drivers are Ethiopians, those who escaped from Ethiopia. In one case, uh, we had to go and pick something up, so I stayed in the taxi to hold it while Kim ran to pick up some tickets. I got to talking to the taxi driver and found out that he had been uh, as a college student in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. He had been a spy, supplying information for the guerrillas in the hill country. One of their colleagues had been captured and horribly tortured. Of course, he did not disclose anything about his relationship, and they were trying to make him confess to who else was involved in the spy network. And finally, they brought in his sister and his father, and they started torturing his sister. And of course, he broke down and told them the names. And uh, so word immediately flashed out that uh, they knew that there were 19 of them that had been identified. And they said, don't leave tomorrow. Don't even go home for your clothes. Don't say goodbye to your parents. Leave now. So 19 of them started out for Kenya, which was south. And as they went along, they knew that typically under the communist system, each village is isolated to itself and if anyone strange that doesn't belong to that village comes through, they're to either make a citizen's arrest or shoot them. And so they had to hide in the daytime and travel at night. And of course, as they went along, out of the 19 that started, four of them made it. Some of them were shot and killed, others died of starvation and exposure. But four of them, he was one of the four, made it to Kenya. He talked about how they, they went to a city, one of the major cities there, and they went to a club and found out that, you know, they identified themselves as being from Ethiopia. And, and the lady that owned the club was apparently a Christian. So she took them in. He said, we're Christian. And they took, she took them in and, and fed them. And uh, they, she gave them a job to work and gave them a place to hide and to eat. And then this lady paid, apparently uh, paid a, a sea captain from uh, Greece to smuggle them on a ship to Greece. And when they got there, they wanted to, of course, get out and get out of the compound, get out of the uh, guarded sea docks there, or sh uh, the port. So the captain told him, he said, look, tell, go, and if they ask you, where's your passport, say, we're just going to get cigarettes. So they went out and they went immediately to the police and said, we're refugees. And apparently Greece had a good relationship with Ethiopia before the communist takeover. So they immediately took them to a refugee camp. So they told them that, uh, look, they told them their story and they checked it out. They contacted the American embassy. They said, well, it'll be at least two years before you can get to America. You'll have to stay here. Well, after the man was there four days, he said he had a vision. And he saw this man in a vision say, you will leave this week. No, actually, he said, you'll leave tomorrow. Sure enough, he came home from work and they said, we've been looking all over for you, the social workers here. And they told him he was coming to America that day. He had lost a lot of weight when he started his trip from Addis Ababa. He weighed 200 pounds. He said by the time he got to Kenya, he weighed 145 pounds. So he had really gone through a lot. And I asked him, I said, you've talked about Christianity. And I know that culturally, Ethiopia is Christian. 
but do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? And he said, yes, I really do. He said, I never would have made it if I hadn't have known Jesus Christ. So I said, may I pray with you? And so Kim and I prayed with him, really asked the Lord to use him. He had lost most of his family. His brother was shot the day after he left Addis Ababa, he found out. You know, I just relate this story because Romans 12 is talking about our obligation in relationship with other believers to help them. I just thought how important it was that the lady in Kenya helped these, these men or they would have died there. And how important along the way that Christians saw their responsibility to help in the need of a fellow Christian. And how God takes, and you know, who knows what God's got in store for that man. I mean, there were such miracles. I prayed that God would use him in the ministry. But you know, it's so important that we witness when we can and that we seek to help when we can. Let's look at Romans chapter 12 and we'll see some of the responsibilities. You know, Romans 12 and 13 actually lay out the believer's relationships and how we're to relate to these obligations that we have in living the Christian life. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, that shows us our obligations that come from the endowment of certain gifts God has given us. How, how we have a responsibility to use those gifts with one another, verses 1 through 8. And then in verses 9 through 21, which is the section we're on, this section shows the obligations that come from living with the fellow Christians within the body of Christ, our obligations to one another, and how in living out the Christian life, we're to have a testimony to the world. And then in chapter 13, this shows us our obligations to live within God's divine institutions. Now, I'll be explaining this a great deal more, but there are certain divine institutions that God has ordained and set up for the whole world, whether they're believers or non-believers. The first divine institution is that of free will, freedom of choice. God ordained that men should have freedom to choose their own destiny. Secondly, God ordained marriage between male and female, that is. And God ordained marriage as an institution to preserve and keep order in the human race. God, the third institution, he ordained the family as the basic building block of society. The family is to be the place where we are to learn most of all how to live in this world and to live in an orderly and decent way. And the fourth divine institution is that of government, the state. And God set up national entities as a divine institution to keep order and uh, to keep justice and protection and peace in the world. Now you can see that in these four divine institutions, man down through history has perverted them and misused them, but nevertheless, these are divine institutions. And chapter 13 shows how we, the believer, are to relate to one of the most important divine institutions, and that is the institution of the state. And we'll get to that. But all right, we have come in the second section, the obligation of living with our fellow believers within the body of Christ and our testimony to the world. We have come in our study there to... Uh, verse 13, verse 13, where it says, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Now this contributing to the needs of the saints is different than the giving that is set forth in verse 8. 
In verse 8, there is a giving to the needs of the church to further the spread of the gospel and the teaching of the word of God and to maintain that ministry. But here in verse 13, it's talking about contributing to the needs of fellow believers. And this word contributing actually means to enter in fellowship with others' needs. It's a word for fellowship. And it's in the present tense, which means we're to constantly be doing this. We're to enter into the fellowship of others' needs and to see their need as our opportunity to help. You know, this should be natural to a spirit-filled Christian to help those other believers who are in need. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17 is a very, very important promise in this regard. It's a command and a promise. And it says this, Proverbs 19, 17. He who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his good deed. Do you get that? What an incredible concept. The one, he who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord. Can you think of anyone you'd rather lend to? Do you think God will ever be in your debt? So if someone has a need, we're to look upon that need as our opportunity to lend to the Lord. And the Lord says, I will repay. And when you stop and think about it, who makes one poor and another rich? Why were we privileged to be born in this country? You know, when you... If you compare, you know, just talking to some of these Ethiopians, and especially that young Ethiopian man, and the many things he told us about living conditions and, and you know, seeking how they help one another, it was really impressive to me to the fact that how privileged we are. The poorest here would be rich in most of the other countries of the world. And yet within the Christian body, the Lord says we are to constantly see our fellow believers' need as our opportunity to give. And the one who gives to that need is actually lending to the Lord, and it is the Lord who makes one rich or poor. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Hold your place, but turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. What a statement. This is something we do by faith, but it says, Give and it will be given to you. By whom? The Lord. If we are generous, God will be generous to us. We don't do it to make a deal with God, but just we can have the faith that if we step out to help our fellow brother or sister in Christ, that God will see to it that we have our needs met. Let's look at this for a minute. Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. This was talking about the measure with which they measured grain. And it says, you know, if, if you give, then when God gives to you, it's just going to the measure is just going to be overflowing, not just meagerly measuring back to you exactly what you gave, but it's going to overflow with abundance. And he says, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by, now listen to this, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Isn't that a wonderful thing that if we give by faith, the Lord says by the, by the standard we measure, he will measure to us, only he says my standard is a little different than yours. You give 
And in proportion to what you give, I'll give you a hundredfold. That doesn't always mean that he'll give us back that in physical, material things. But he will give material things to supply our needs. But he says, in proportion to what you give, I'll give a hundred, a hundred times that much back to you. Now that's a great guarantee. Remember, when you're gracious to the poor, God says, you're lending to me. I don't care how hard you work. It's the Lord that makes you prosper. I've seen men work their heads off and have nothing. And of course, I mean, we shouldn't sit back and not seek to support ourselves. The Lord says that uh, if a man will not work, neither should he eat. So we're not talking about giving handouts to those who refuse to work. Although there's sometimes people that are so emotionally damaged that for the moment they need to be taught how to work and we help them anyway. But you know something? It is the Lord that will repay. And I've never seen the Lord fail the person who is generous and gracious because the Lord says, freely you have received, freely give. And it says, let's look at an example of this. In Acts chapter 4, you may say, well, you know, what's the extent of this responsibility? Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Here's an example. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him or was, or was his own. But all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. And so on. So this was a situation in the early church where there was such a tremendous new harvest of believers and they were there from all over the Roman world. They'd probably come to uh, planning to stay a few days and had money to stay maybe at most a couple of weeks. But all of a sudden their lives are transformed. They've become believers in Jesus Christ and they want to learn about this new faith before they go back. So some just planned to stay for two or three months so they could learn the faith before they went back to their homes. And so what happened is those who were residents of, of Jerusalem began to sell things in order to give so that they could stay and they could be taught the word of God. It was an extraordinary circumstance, but it gives the ultimate example of generosity. You know, I believe that uh, one of the large parts of this is that each individual church should be a training place to train saints for the work of the ministry. And when we get our new facility and we begin to really set up a school for training people for the ministry, God is going to tap some of you on the shoulder to help those who come to be trained, some that come to be trained for the ministry, to help them along. And I believe that's what this is really focusing on. And in the same verse, Romans 12 again, Romans 12, 13, it says, practicing hospitality. And this means to take in those that are in the body of Christ that are in need and to be quick to joyfully give a hospitality to those that are in need that are in the fellow body of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 uh, verse 2 talks about this. It says, be, I'll read it exactly. 
Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. And, uh, you know, there have been a few cases when uh, I've had my wonder about uh, people I, I met. And we had fellowship together. I helped them along and then never saw them again. And I wonder, hey, maybe they were angels visiting. Who knows? But you never know. In Romans chapter 16, you have some beautiful examples of hospitality in the early church. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Sincrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. So here he's exhorting them to show hospitality to this one who was traveling for the sake of the Lord to minister. In verse 23 of chapter 16, there's also another example. It says, Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you, and Quartus, the brother. So he talks about Gaius was a host to him. That is, he had him in his home and, and took care of him. And he says he's also a host to the whole church. Well, I'm sure Gaius has a beautiful mansion in heaven because, you know, God says that he rewards people for their showing of hospitality. He rewards them generously. All right, Romans 12 again, verse 14, where it says, Bless those who persecute you, and bless and curse not. Now, this is a tough one for me. I am an Apache. In the flesh, you do me wrong, and if it takes me 20 years, I'll get even. But in the spirit, that has no place. None at all. But you know, each one of these exhortations here are things that can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot, you, there may be a few things that you can do in the flesh. For instance, some people are kind of generous just in the flesh. But this is not what God wants us to do. He wants us to do everything as unto the Lord. And there are certain commands that are absolutely impossible to carry out without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because you see, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, is really the same as 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know that? Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, is spelling out to the practical-minded Romans what God's love is in action. And he is, this whole section, all of these exhortations are simply a pragmatic demonstration and explanation of what agape love is. All of these things can only be done out of the source of God's agape love, that divine kind of love. And so you have to moment by moment depend upon the Holy Spirit to do this and say no to the natural inclinations of the old sin nature. The old sin nature in all of us is selfish. The old sin nature in all of us wants to get back at someone who hurts me. That's the first natural reflex of humanity is to get back. But you know... The Lord says, bless those who persecute you. What does it mean to bless those who persecute you? It means to pray for them and pray for God's blessing on them. People who have hurt you, people who have maligned you, people who have deliberately done you evil. And this, by the way, is talking about people within the body of Christ. In the next chapter, we'll talk about how we get along with those outside the body of Christ. But we are to bless the fellow believers who hurt us. And that, my friends, takes divine power. 
Bless them and curse them not. Don't bless them and then when they walk off say, you so-and-so, God will get you. Let them have it, Lord. No, we're not supposed to do that. And as I say this, I'm as convicted as you are. But this is what God wants. He wants us to pray God's blessing upon those who persecute us. In Matthew 5, verses 44 through 46, we have this spelled out, what it means to bless those who persecute you. Where Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the IRS agents do the same. <laughs> the collectors of infernal revenue. But the idea is this. Hey, the world can muster up kindly feelings toward people who are kind to you. But if you're going to demonstrate the life of Christ, then you pray God's blessing upon those who hurt you. And God says this is important. You know why it's important to you? There is nothing more destructive to your soul and to your, your well-being, your mental well-being, your mental health than to hold grudges and to constantly be wanting to get even. It doesn't hurt them nearly as much as it hurts you. And the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to actually pray for and ask God's blessing upon them without vindictiveness and without wanting to take it back and say, God, cuss him. But this is the outworking of the spirit-filled life. Don't tell me you're spirit-filled because you do certain things. This is the evidence of the spirit-filled life. Now, going on, it says, you know, I think the ultimate example of this, and I'll just, without going into too much more detail, the ultimate example of what it means to bless those who hurt you is when Jesus was nailed to the cross and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now these people had humiliated, mocked, and in every way injured Jesus. They had made sport of him. They had torn his back raw with a cat of nine tails. They had pushed that painful thorn thing down on his head in mockery of a crown. They had destroyed his face by beating him all night long. He was hanging on a cross for something he had, for a, a guilt he was not guilty of. He had no crime but to love others and to be there to give his life a ransom for them. And yet, in all of this injustice, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. In the original Greek, it says, Father, let them go on. Forgive them and let them go on with it, for they don't know what they're doing. Apparently, the Father was going to destroy the whole bunch, and Jesus interceded for them. And let them get on with it. Wow. The Christian life gets exciting when you get into this kind of, of living. This is where the real acid test of whether you know how to be filled with the Spirit comes in. All right, let's look at Romans 12, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You know what this means? It means enter into 
the joy of those who are rejoicing over something the Lord has given them. Enter into the joy of those who are rejoicing over something the Lord has given them. And don't be jealous or envious of it. That's the point. You know, I can remember many occasions when God blessed me and with a group of men that I worked with, I would share it with them in joy of what God had done. I recognized only God had given it to me by his grace. I had no, uh, no other motive than just rejoicing. Look what the Lord has done. And you know, it finally got to the point where I didn't share anything with them anymore because there was such jealousy and envy that I just said, to heck with you. I won't share my joy with you anymore. But you know, we should learn that if God blesses one, he blesses us all with it. We should all rejoice at the profit and the joy of another brother in Christ and not be envious or jealous of it, but say, praise the Lord, look how gracious he's been. And it says, weep with those who weep to enter into the sorrow of others. And that carries with it that other negative connotation, not to rejoice over another's calamity. And I've seen that in the Christian life too. I've seen that in the Christian church. Where somebody goes in, gets a calamity, here comes Job's friends. You know, they sit there and while they feign to be sorrowing with you, they're saying, I wonder what evil he did that God got even with him. No, this says to give genuine sorrow with someone who sorrows. And don't be sorry when someone else is rejoicing and don't be rejoicing when someone else is sorry. See, keep the appropriate attitude. That's the idea. And that also is a demonstration of whether the Holy Spirit is in control of the life. Now, going on. Verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Now this is a verse that basically says there are no class distinctions in the body of Christ. There are no class distinctions. Be of the same mind means do not be partial in your attitude toward some and not toward others. Have the same esteem and regard toward the poor and the handicapped as you do toward the rich, the famous, and the beautiful. See, in context, that's what this means here of being in the same mind. Don't, don't be constantly seeking out the rich, the famous, the beautiful. But have the same attitude of love. Be of the same mind toward those who are less fortunate, toward those who are handicapped, toward those who are poor, toward those that are not so cultured. Because there just cannot be class distinction, racial distinctions, social distinctions in the body of Christ. God says he hates that. Because after all, once again, who makes one what he is and another what he is? And so it says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind. Don't consider yourself superior to someone and count them as unworthy of your care, concern, or help. That's the idea. Don't be haughty. Hold yourself above others. Be arrogant or conceited toward others. But have the same regard toward all of the body of Christ. And God says, 
he will bless you. This is showing, this is the love of Christ in action. Jesus didn't care whether a man had great or nothing. Jesus didn't care whether someone was crippled or whether they were beautiful. Jesus had the same love toward all. And he looked out for their needs. It says, but associate with the lowly. This is the heart of the command. Associate with the lowly. Take time to fellowship with and to teach and to share and to listen to the lowly, to those that are not so fortunate. And that's God's way, isn't it? Christianity exalts the status of the lowly and humbles the status of the mighty. Because if we see people with Christ eyes, we see each person is having that infinite worth that God sees in them. Each person has enough worth that Christ was willing to die for them. All right. And it says, do not be wise in your own estimation. This is the idea of being conceited so as to consider your intelligence, your wisdom as superior to everybody else's, not willing to listen to others. Verse 17, never pay back evil for evil. Never pay back evil for evil, but respect what is right in the sight of all men. You know, this is a, another command that's difficult for me. But yet, when we're filled with the Spirit, God enables us to have such a beautiful expression of His love. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. The idea is we're not to take revenge on people. We're not to become the executioner of justice. So it says, this, by the way, refers to interpersonal relationships. You know, one of the biggest problems we have, one of the great confusions in the church as well as in American society today, is they confuse commands that God gives for interpersonal relationships with, with commands God gives to uh, a, civil, a civil servant, a policeman, a soldier, or a judge in a courtroom. Now you can't say to a judge, never repay evil for evil, although I think some judges think that's what they're supposed to do. When a judge sits in judgment in a civil courtroom, he is under the divine institution of the state, and as we'll see in Romans chapter 13, he is to carry out justice and he, was, he is to he is to mete out a punishment that's appropriate to the crime. But we are not supposed to take justice into our own hands and carry that out. That's the point here. And it says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. And this is simply the idea, you know, there are certain things within any given society that are not right, they're, they're, they're not divine institutions, but they're simply right, they're customs that are right. So we're not to go roughshod over the customs of the society we live in simply because we know we're Christians and we're free from everything. The idea is to have a good testimony with those without. And so, uh, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 gives the best illustration of that. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians, which is just a book over. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Nine verse 19. 
For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I become as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without law of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Now what's the point? The point is that we adapt ourselves for the sake of the gospel to many things that are in the culture that are not wrong. We adapt ourselves so that we don't give a stumbling block to those who are around us. And I'll tell you one thing. There is, there is no more astute discerner of hypocrisy than the world when it looks on the Christian. The world can spot duplicity, hypocrisy, and inconsistency in a Christian quicker than anyone can. And when we don't even measure up to the world's standards, and I, I think the case in point, so much of what goes on today in, in uh, the church, in the ministry, in PTL and all of that, but that, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of that that goes on. That when we don't even measure up to the world standards, boy, they look on and they just slaughter us. And the gospel gets trampled underfoot. And so this is simply an exhortation. Look, seek to live in such a way that you, even the, the customs of the society you live, that you don't run roughshod over them and thus give them a ground to reject the gospel or malign Christ. And that's the point. All right, in Romans chapter 12 again. Respect what is right in the sight of all men then. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now note, I, I'm happy that he puts an if there. Because frankly, sometimes it is impossible to live at peace with everybody. But as far as it is possible from our own side, live at peace with people. You know, there's some, there are some people, the more, the, uh, the kinder you are to them, the more they hate you. And the more you seek to bring peace, the more they hate you. Well, okay. From your side, you just keep on being what God wants you to be and let God take care of them. But as much as it is possible from your initiative, live at peace with people. That's the point. And there too, hey, that takes the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's only possible by the love of God that comes from the Holy Spirit alone. A moment by moment dependence upon the Holy Spirit, not trying to crank this out by your own human effort. You try to do this in human strength, you're going to wind up like Paul did. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Believe me, that's where you'll be if you try to live like this by the, by the flesh. When you're tempted to do other than this, when you're tempted to be angry, when you're tempted to take vengeance, you know what you do? You say no to that. That's all God requires you to do. Then you focus on Christ and on his promise to produce that in you. And when you focus on the problem solver, he deals with the problem. If you focus on the problem, even with the good intention of trying to do that, you know what happens? The problem becomes greater than you are and, and pushes everything out of the way and soon the problem dominates you. It's tough. But you know something? There's nothing more beautiful or fulfilling than living this kind of life. There's nothing more attractive to God. Maybe, maybe people won't 
listen, the Bible says the, that uh, the world and even out of fellowship Christians will not understand the spiritual man. They don't. But you don't worry about that. It's God that you're seeking to please. Okay. Verse 19, never take your own venge or revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. I like that statement, leave room for the wrath of God. In other words, get out of his way. Let God have room to, to swing his wrath. And this is talking about, you know, God deals with those. You be what God says you, you should be and let God take care of what needs to be done. And he says, don't take revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, and here's a quote from God promise, a promise in the Old Testament. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now remember what he exhorted up above, bless and don't curse? When it says, leave room for the wrath of God, don't you get it? Get him, Lord. I'm not going to get him, but boy, get him, Lord. Draw and quarter him. No, we're not supposed to do that. But the Lord says, get out of the way. Because rest assured, vengeance is mine. I will repay. It goes on. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, that's the overruling principle right there. The Christian is not to be overcome by the evil around him and the evil that is done to him. He is to overcome evil by good. And you say, but how in the world can you live in this world like that? There's only one way. You trust what God says. He says, you live the way you're supposed to and I will deal with those turkeys out there that want to take advantage of you. And you just, in the meantime, don't worry about it. You know, the greatest demonstration of this I ever heard was a situation that occurred when I was in Campus Crusade for Christ. We had a number of nationals from various countries all over the world who would come for training. And I remember Pastor Kim, who came from Korea to take up the, he was, he came to take up the headship of Campus Crusade for all of Korea. And I met the man and he was a very quiet man. And uh, I always like to study what kind of character each one of these national directors had. And I always wondered, you know, on what basis were they selected? Well, there was a kind of a quiet power about this man I didn't understand. And then one night he gave his testimony of what had happened to him and how God had transformed his life. And he told of how when the North Koreans overran the southern regions that one of the North Korean officers had come to his home. He took his wife and his children and himself and he lined them all up and he shot them all, commanded them all to be machine gun. They were Christians. You know, he found the Bible and they, I won't say what they did on top of it, but they desecrated it. And because they were Christians, they were especially cruel to him. They just lined the whole family up, wife, children, him, everything, and a machine gun. Although they thought he was dead and he wasn't. He survived. He managed to crawl over and uh, then some American troops that were counterattacking came through and they found him and they gave him medical aid, got him to a medevac and he was saved. A year later, he was in the South Korean army and he was 
called in to interrogate a captured officer. And it was the man who had commanded the firing squad that killed his wife, his children, and shot him. You know what he did? The man recognized him and was terrified. He sat down and told him, I forgive you. And he gave him the gospel and led him to Christ. I don't know whether I could do that. I know I couldn't in the flesh. I don't know whether I have that kind of faith. But that man had the mark of Christ about his life in a way that I've rarely ever seen. You know that the national religious broadcasters, there was a man there, a pastor from Nicaragua, who had been taken in because he was an evangelical pastor by the Sandinistas, and he was interrogated for days he was, he was uh, tortured, he was humiliated in every way, and finally, when they couldn't break him down, they released him. And as he left, he told the officer in charge, I forgive you and I love you because Jesus Christ died for you. The man was at the NRB. But you know, that is, that is the kind of love that only the Holy Spirit can produce. We can't do that. But that's what we should grow toward. You know, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is like the fruit on a tree. You know, Jesus uses the, the allegory of the vine to talk about the Spirit-filled life. And he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, so you cannot bear fruit except you abide in me. Now, it's very obvious if you look at a vine. By the way, I, I went out and studied a vine physically just to, to learn what that allegory was all about. And as I studied the vine, I looked at it and I said, of all the plants, the branch of a vine looks most like the vine itself. You know, you look at a tree, you can easily see a limb in the tree. But in a vine, the branches in the vine look most alike. Sometimes you can hardly tell them apart. But as I studied the vine, I asked myself, now how does this represent the Christian life? And then I realized there was an unsung hero about a vine that produces, that takes the life of the vine into the branch. Is that, for lack of a better word, protoplasm that we call sap. That life-giving fluid that we call sap that comes from the root up through the vine and out into the branches. And as long as that branch is vitally connected to the vine, the life of the vine flows out through the sap into the branches and the sap produces the fruit. The branches simply have to be in the position so that it can receive the strength of the sap. The Holy Spirit is the sap. And the Holy Spirit, as long as we're abiding in Christ by a moment-by-moment -moment dependence upon Him, the Holy Spirit flows the life of Christ into us and He begins to develop fruit. But you know, when fruit appears, fruit is not always full-grown, is it? First fruit begins by a small flower, usually a blossom of some kind. Then that blossom begins to take the shape of the fruit. And first it's small, green. Then it begins to become larger until it becomes mature fruit. That's the way the Christian life grows. You know, maturity is a process. Being filled with the Spirit's an either or. Any given moment you're filled with the Spirit or you're not filled with the Spirit, it's dependent upon your choice and your faith. You must choose to say no to the old life and to say yes to Christ and to have an attitude of dependence upon Christ. 
Now, as you do that, fruit will begin to develop. And the more you live in dependence upon Christ, allowing his life through the Holy Spirit to flow through you, the more that fruit will become mature so that at last you will be like Pastor Kim in some areas where you can demonstrate the love of Christ on that degree. God will not call on all of us to give a demonstration like that. But every day, we have occasion to demonstrate the life of Christ. And Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, is simply 1 Corinthians chapter 13, spelled out in practical order. Let's make our choice to live by the power of the Holy Spirit increasingly according to this exhortation that's here. Make a choice right now to depend upon the Holy Spirit today and each day this week and just see what God will do. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that you have called us to a supernatural life that cannot be lived by human means. And we pray that through the Holy Spirit, this kind of fruit will blossom within each one of us. And we pray, Lord, that this body of Christ will begin to manifest through its individual branches this life that is the very life of Christ. And Father, I pray for anyone who is here this morning that is not sure that he or she is in the family of God. I pray for that one that's not sure that she has the forgiveness of Christ. That one that's not sure that he has eternal life. May that one right now pray this prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for dying for me. I confess I can't be good enough for you to accept. So right now, I receive your pardon. Thank you for forgiving me. Lord Jesus, make my life pleasing to the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Defense Department's highest level of readiness for nuclear war is called DEFCON 1. We are warned by Jesus in the book of Matthew to be ready. Is it that time?